Today's episode is a masterclass on supply chain optimization, product development, finance, and performance marketing from the founder of a product-led omnichannel homeware brand called Sunday Citizen. It's a great episode. You don't want to miss it. Do stay tuned. So on today's episode, I'm joined by Micah Baddy, co-founder and CEO of Sunday Citizen, a homeware brand that manufactures and sells, in their words, the world's softest blankets that are durable and can withstand multiple washes. Sunday Citizen started out in 2018 as a direct-to-consumer brand, but has rapidly accelerated to transform it into an omni-channel brand with a flagship store in Soho, New York and several retail distribution partnerships with retailers like Bloomingdale, Anthropology, Nordstrom, and as you guessed it, Amazon. It's worth noting that Sony Citizen was founded by a team of experienced entrepreneurs and textile experts with the aim to delivering high quality products at an affordable price point. So why should you listen to this episode? First, why focusing on bringing to market a first of its kind high quality product has been the key driver of success to Sunday Citizen. Mike first explains how they crystallized the ideation of their flagship product, um, their ultra soft blanket, and the iterative customer feedback system that they currently use in their agile product iterations right now. Mike speaks in depth about the importance of supply chain management and how the impact of COVID made Sunday Citizen diversify its supply chain by shifting a significant part of its production to Mexico. You learn why Mexico makes an excellent option for reduced lead times and risk exposure if you're based in North America. And then finally, Mike shares Sunday Citizen's financial stack. This was my favorite that enabled them to scale rapidly. He also emphasizes the need to align short term and long-term finances and the value of collecting customer data and unifying it across brick and mortar and online. So if you want a masterclass on supply chain optimization, product development, finance, and a bit of marketing, then pay attention. Mike and I dabble quite deeply into his backstory at the start of this interview, but I implore you to listen to his super interesting personal story as it sets the foundation for his foray into founding Sunday Citizen. So without further ado, Let's get started. Hey, Mike, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. Hey, Kunle, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure. It's been a long time coming. We were meant to to speak a couple of times and yeah, it's finally happened and and I'm super excited about this one. Yeah, looking forward to it. Amazing, amazing. All right, Mike, you're an entrepreneur. You're, you're based out in Miami, Florida. I want to get to Mike as a child, Mike as a teenager, and, and just what was growing up like for you. Let's, let's jump into to, to that piece and, and try and connect it to, to Sunday Citizen. Okay, great. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm originally uh, born in Colombia, um, in Bogota, Colombia, um, I, I, I was there for the first nine years of my life. Um, I was there that, that was sort of like the time when Colombia was very dangerous and, and we, as a family were forced to leave, uh, and we ended up going to Mexico. So I moved to Mexico when I was around 10 years old. Um, and I grew up in Mexico, basically that's, that's sort of like where I grew up. I, I went there all the way through high school. I graduated um in mexico city um and from there i ended up moving to the united states uh for um for college um Mm -hmm. so uh, during all this you know uh, in colombia and and in mexico you know my i come from a textile family my my father's a textile engineer one of the few that are that actually still exist Uh, Mm -hmm. my Grandfather was in textiles. My great grandfather was in textiles. So, uh, since I've, I'm a little boy, I've been surrounded by textiles. You know, I remember as a young kid, um, playing, you know, visiting my dad at work and playing in the big mountains of, he used to have like big bags of cotton. Uh, Mm -hmm. and I used to play there as a kid, climb it, jump into the cotton. And it was like something that I've been, it's been part of my DNA. Uh, since I'm, since I was born pretty much, you know, so I've always been 
um, exposed to to textiles. But you know, for me, it was also I was also very exposed to um, to change. You know, like we, mm-hmm. we, you know, growing up, we you know in Colombia, then Mexico, then the U.S. Uh, I, I, you know, very very young, um, I got used to the idea of changing and 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 starting starting fresh and i think that sort of like built in um um a level of risk tolerance that really uh, came through and materialized as an entrepreneur right because Mm. at the end of the day you need that level of risk tolerance to be become an entrepreneur and so i i i definitely think that my environment growing up uh, and the way that i saw my parents deal with change and and starting from scratch time and time again, hmm. really um, drilled that in me. Hmm. Interesting. There's a, there's a story in the UK about um, entrepreneurs, uh, sorry, about Indians, Indian immigrants in the UK who came from Uganda, right? So you have Indians who came to the UK from India, from homeland India, and then you had Indians who came from Uganda and like 80% of the time, the Indians who came from Uganda in the UK tended to set their own businesses up here. They, they're entrepreneurs, they're very accomplished people. And it turns out that they were, they were like entrepreneurs. It was like they're entrepreneurs in, in, in Uganda, you know, when they were expelled in, in the seventies by the India, by the Idi Amin, you know, um, um, regime, they just didn't you know they had nothing they came here with just their clothes a lot of them you know, just one suitcase and they somehow mustered that courage to they didn't see any other way <laughs> and they mustered up that courage to, to 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 set up you know and and they did really really well so they saw like you know the like the many indians here why isn't there no, no, nobody bringing basmati rice and they started to import rice and all of that stuff seeing seeing opportunities so i, I guess in, in that sense you know you you your parents actually locating from colombia to, to mexico and then starting business again and you have the bog so how long were you in Mexico for, and when did you eventually, you know, um, get to 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 the states to 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 to, to my? Has it always been Miami, or did you go go elsewhere? Yeah, so basically, I I stayed in Mexico until I finished high school, mm-hmm. and at that at that time, um, my my parents decided to move to Miami, so I was right in the process of. Uh, you know, applying to college. Uh, I knew I wanted to study in the U.S. Um, that, that was a given. But when I when I found that my parents were moving to Miami and my whole family was going to be there, you know, that's I decided to do college in Miami. So we pretty much moved at the same time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and what was, was college like for you? And what was the objective of going to college? Did you, what did you study and... Um, what was your objective? Was it to, 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 to get a corporate job for, for, for initial experience? What were your expectations initially? Yeah. So, um, when I went into college, um, I think since I've been very young, I've always known that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and that I wanted to do my own thing. But, uh, I always knew that the best place to learn, um, was, in the corporate world. So um, when I got to college, I, I decided that um, I, you know, I, I wanted, I really had as a goal to work in Wall Street. Um, I, I, I always saw having that financial training as, as being a very important part for any, any type of entrepreneur. Uh, and when I got to Miami, I decided to um, do a, uh, dual major in finance and then operations research, you know, so um, I've always been very numbers focused, very, uh, I've always liked math. So I decided to, to study something that involved um, business, but through the lens of numbers uh, with a big focus on prob- probability statistics um, and, and things that to the, to this day, I be, I think are becoming more and more relevant, you know? Um, and, and yeah, so I, I, I ended up, um, when I was in sophomore year, I ended up 
getting my first internship at Lehman Brothers. Uh, so that, that, that was uh, a great experience and, and it was a, an experience that allowed me to do a rotation among different parts of the investment banking world. So I did uh, some sales and trading, I did a currencies exchange, I did uh, corporate finance and investment banking on the, uh, on the natural resources side. I was in the natural resource group there, uh, and I really got to see a little bit of everything. Um, mm -hmm. It was a great experience living in New York. I loved it. And then when I, um, for junior year, I decided to do, I, I got offered to do an internship with them again. So I came back to Lehman Brothers as a junior uh, um, intern. Um, at that time, I, I basically decided that I preferred the corporate finance side of things versus the sales and trading. So I did my internship there. And um, eventually I was offered a full-time job with Lehman Brothers. And that was in 2008. So literally oh. I was there <laughs> in the summer as the bank was sort of like <laughs> collapsing and then the, the whole world was collapsing. And uh, it was very interesting, interesting, you know, because we got exposed to, we got exposed to, um, top senior management, you know, I, 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 we, I got exposed to the, uh, to the CEO, Dick Fold, and, and it was, it was great to be there. Like, it, like it was scary, but looking back, it was an incredible experience to be able to be in the bank during those last months of Lehman Brothers. Um, I mean, to the point where all the, all the salary that I, I got through my internship, um, I put it all into Lehman stock because Whoa the the energy that i felt being there like you just felt everybody was so optimistic that the bank was gonna pull through and 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 lehman brothers was the bank in wall street that had the biggest percentage of ownership among employees like the the the, the percent of owners that were actual employees at the company was the biggest bank in wall street like literally you felt the sense of like this is my bank this is my company um through 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 coworkers from the managing directors all the way down, you felt that sense of ownership, and really people were doubling down on their faith of the company. And I followed suit; that, that didn't go too well, and and um, I lost all the all the money I invested. But um, I mean, I left that summer with an offer to come back. A, I think it was like a month later. I get the we get the news that Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt um so at the time we were like i don't know what's going to happen what's going to happen then barclays comes in and does like an asset purchase mm -hmm. and a few weeks later we get a le like the equivalent offer letter from barclays so for me mm -hmm. it was a very stressful couple months but at the end of it, it all worked out i went back to work in barclays pretty much in the same group in the same building everything was identical as what it was with Lehman Brothers, same co-worker, so it was great at the end. It's it's quite interesting that um, this this bit of detail <clears throat> about the transition to Barclays Capital is never really covered in the news. We just hear about the collapse and, and that's it. So so thank you for the insights there. Okay, so you you're obviously now in Miami in, in New York. So so what how did that journey from from New York? First of all, how does New York compare to or how from your experience because this is probably anecdotal, how does New York compare to Miami and how did that journey back home essentially um start from 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 from, from Wall Street? So yeah, look, for me, now that in my mid-30s with a wife and three kids, Miami's a great place to be. But being young and at that time of my life, New York was incomparable. You know, like I think, you know, right now we get a lot of New Yorkers moving into Miami and it's such a slower pace of life compared to what it is in New York that, um, you know, sometimes I wonder how many of those will actually last here and how many will end up going back because you can't compare that level of energy that you get in new york but again i think it's something where it was great for that time of my life but now with kids i can't see myself living in my in new york um so you know when i was my in my last year of college um i ended up ended up starting a side business 
<clears throat> of selling solar water heaters in Colombia. So um, during my last, I, I did a I did a six month study abroad while I was in college in Hong Kong. And when I was in Hong Kong, I used to travel a, a lot through China. And in China, you see everywhere, everywhere they use solar water heaters to heat up the water in their houses. They don't use gas or electric. And it's a, it's almost all solar. So I saw that product and I thought, wow, that's such a great product for Colombia because it wasn't only the environmental aspect, but it was also a very cost saving solution for people. And in Colombia, people with limited means, they still shower with cold water. So, so for me, it was a great product to introduce to Colombia. Um, uh, I had a, um, uh, I, I pitched the product to uh, um, a big brand in Colombia that that s sold this type of product. They loved it, so we started a partnership with them, and and the product started selling in Colombia when I was still in um, in in college. Um, so when I left to to Barclays Capital. I ended up finding a partner that sort of took over the business and, and, and he, he, he took care of everything and I just left to New York. Um, but the idea was always for me to come back, you know? So a, I, I, I think for me, Wall Street was a great place to learn. You know, it was, for me, it was like an MBA really, you know, the, the amount mm -hmm. of stuff that you learn is incredible. The amount of exposure is incredible, but I knew I didn't want to make a career out of it. so. Eventually, I ended up leaving Barclays and going back, coming back to Miami to continue working on this a, a renewable energy startup that we had. Um, at the time, it was it had grown it, it had grown a bit, but it was struggling and it was trying to find out its fit. And so that was my first entrepreneurial project um, when I left banking. Um, that 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 business in itself didn't really end up working out um i mean we kept selling the solar heaters in colombia but that was about it like we weren't able to expand it much more um i tried other products i tried selling like electric motorcycles in colombia um so after coming to miami i ended up moving to to Colombia for a bit to try to sell electric motorcycles. This was in 2010. So, you know, it was still a very early product. Like we were one of the first to introduce the product to Colombia. And I think we were a little bit too early, you know, like people were very skeptical about the product. They were like, oh, what if it rains? Will I get electrocuted? You know, so the idea of like an electric vehicle was still a little too new for them. Um, and that business didn't really end up working out. And, you know, when, as another entrepreneurial a parenthesis, when I was in college, um, so, so going back to my study abroad in Hong Kong, right? I was studying abroad in Hong Kong. I knew I had my job in, 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 in Lehman Brothers lined up and I knew I had to wear a suit every single day once my job started, right? So when I was in Hong Kong, I actually found these like Hong Kong tailors that do amazing suits, very, very high quality tailor-made suits. Um, you know, you chose the fabric, they measured your body and they, they fit perfectly, you know? Like for me, I always had a hard time finding suits that fit, fit me well in the US. So um, when I went back to college, I to a lot of my friends and my roommates and a lot of people that were also trying to get jobs, I ended up learning how to take measurements. Mm -hmm. um, so I would take measurements of my friends and, and other people in college. I had like a fabric book with me mm -hmm. and I started selling them uh, tailor-made suits from my tailor back in Hong Kong. And, and, and that was like a nice little site business that I had in college. And I realized, I realized the, 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 the value that there was in tailor-made suits. So after the motor, after the electric motorcycle business didn't work out in Colombia, I decided to, to start this business of tailor-made suits for um, pretty much people in New York, investment bankers or, or corporate people that needed 
tailor-made suits at a fraction of the price of what they normally cost. So um, I ended up partnering with another um, friend of mine that was an investment banker and we launched Hyven Colony. And um, at the beginning, what we did was we uh, had like, um, um, we got like an old FedEx truck we retrofitted it for to look, you know, with our brand on the outside. Inside, we did like a nice living room area where we had like a sofa, uh, an espresso machine, some whiskey bottles. We had like fabric rolls that people could touch. And in the back of the truck, we had a 3D scanner. So we would drive around Manhattan and people would come down from, the, from their corporate offices, get scanned through this 3D scanner. They would choose their fabric and then three weeks later, they would get their suit mailed to their house uh, mm-hmm. at a fraction of the price of what like a Hugo Boss would cost. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, so that was a, uh, a great experience. And, and we started to do very well. You know, we got a lot of press coverage. We, we, we were like in CNBC. We were like in the Wall Street Journal. You know, it was a very innovative idea and, and, and it got a lot of traction. Uh, but the problem was that we, you know, if it, it was a, it was a truck, right? So it, 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 if it was a rainy day, you wouldn't sell that day. If it was too hot, you didn't sell. If it was too cold, you didn't sell. If you didn't find a good parking spot, you didn't sell, right? So it was very very variable, right? So we 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 knew that we needed um, a permanent brick and mortar location, um, and for that we needed capital. So at that point, we got like a, a financial a partner that ended up basically buying out my other partner, you Mm -hmm. know, so he left the business, this financial partner came in and um, he capitalized the business so that we could open brick and mortar locations. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we opened our first brick and mortar location in Boston. Um, You know, that location is still, still working. It's still up and running. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and um, and I ended up have starting to have some problems with my with my partner, and you know he basically ended up forcing me out of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, so he forced me out of the business around this was what 2015, yeah, more or less 2000. No, mm-hmm. a little later, like 2017, um, he ended up a, a kicking me out of the business. Um, and and yeah so so that business is actually still a on today i think they have like 10 or 11 stores uh but uh but yeah i'm no longer involved in that okay so that that's that's very long long intro but but very important because um sunday citizen which is what we're here to talk about is you know your most recent venture it's been running for three years i believe yes and, and so what led to, to found, you know, found you, I believe you're, you it's co-founded, you're a co-founder along with your, with your wife. So, so what was the genesis to, to Sunday Citizen? What's the why behind Sunday Citizen? How did you, you know, get started with, with Sunday Citizen? So, so when I was still doing the suit business, I moved, I was living in Shanghai because that's where we were doing most of our productions. I was living in Shanghai. And being in Shanghai, I would get a lot of people that would reach out to me and said, hey, Mike, since you're in Shanghai, can you help me find this product to make in China? Can you help me that product to make in China? So um, I found that it was very valuable for me to be there. And I ended up opening like a little side business of like uh, just sourcing, sourcing. Yeah. sourcing products in China for people of all types. And I, I ended up getting all types of sourcing requests and anything you can imagine. I, we, we ended up having to source in China. Uh, and one of the, one of those requests came from a hotel owner who was based here in Miami. Um, he owned a lot of like high end boutique hotels and he was looking for a blanket for his hotels. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a guy who's extremely, extremely fabric centric, like everything in his life, his home, his clothes has to be extremely soft. And for his hotels, he was looking for a blanket that had to be very, very soft, but also being able to with, you know, stand the wear and tear of hotel mm-hmm. use. Mm-hmm. Right. So 
he um, came to me specifically to develop a blanket for his hotels. That's where we developed the blanket that ended up being a huge success. Uh, the guests at the hotel would love it. They would ask if they could buy it when they checked out. So he started selling them in the hotel lobbies. They started to perform very well. Uh, so we, we had this product that was sort of like in this beta stage for like two, three years, really like seeing that it was it had a lot of potential, but not really doing anything with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so after I left a, the, the, the suit business, um, I was looking for things to do. And that's when we my wife and I reached out to uh, the, the, the hotel owner and his brother and say, hey, why don't we partner and take this product to market? You know, we have a great product in our hands. Let's take it to market. And that's when Sunday Citizen was born. So so Sunday Citizen started um, only with blankets at the very beginning. You know, when we first launched, we only had blankets, which were pretty much the same blankets that we were selling in the in the hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, And during when we started the business, we realized that we had to be in China again. So, so once again, I moved to China this time with my wife and two babies at the time, you know, one mm-hmm. of them was like two years old. The other was one. So, so we moved to China as a family. Um, and, to Shanghai and started, again or so, so elsewhere? Yeah. No, in Shanghai, okay. in Shanghai. Right. Um, and we really started working on developing the product um, because the product that we developed it's not a product that you can go to an existing factory and say, hey, show us your catalog and you just pick a couple of colors and you mm-hmm. place the order, right? We, we were really developing the product from the yarn up, you know? Okay. Um, and, uh, do you think, you know, you, you talked about the fact that your, your, your dad was into textiles. Did you learn, did you lean on him on, on any guidance on, on, because this is really technical clothing here or technical fabrics here. Because you're talking about yeah. soft, supple, and at the same time, it has to withstand daily washes and use, right? So, did did he did he lend a hand there? Or absolutely, he's been involved basically since the very beginning. He mm. was involved uh, from the very very beginning. Uh, he was helping me throughout the process of developing these products. Um, he didn't move to Shanghai with us, but he was basically guiding us and, 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 and advising us on every step of the way. Mm. Uh, so what we ended up, ended up doing is that we, uh, being in China, it allowed us to really expand the product line very quickly. Mm-hmm. So we went from just blankets into the whole bed. You know, we started doing bed sheets. We started doing comforters, pillows, weighted blankets. We got into loungewear. Uh, we got into all these categories very, very quickly because being on the ground really allowed us to build great relationships with the factories. We built a great team there. Um, and so we grew the product categories quite rapidly, but every single product that we added, every single product maintained that original value proposition of the blanket of that original blanket of extreme softness and easy care washability. So till this day, Every single product has to meet those two criteria. We will not sell anything that doesn't meet those two criteria. So, so, so we kept that that value of the brand uh, for the product and the brand uh, very, very focused from the very, very beginning. Yeah, and, and I think with with such a unique thing you're building, seeking the right partners in China must have been like it is still super important, um, particularly also from an IP standpoint. How are you protecting the IP for for Sunday citizen to, to ensuring you know um, that there, there are no duplicates or a competitor just doesn't you know take that secret source and you know run away with it? Yeah, look. So so, so what we try to do is we. We try to control the whole step of the process from from the yarn all the way to the finished product, right? Mm-hmm. So, so we're buying our own yarn, and we have one factory for the yarn, one that's doing the the, the knitting, one that's doing the finished product. So, so we're controlling the whole process, um, and and really coming up with our own um, a our, our own fabric blends and everything. But at the end of the day, there's no 
protection and you know you every the, the, the everything can be copied very quick you know especially in the textile world it's it's not like um technology where you have more barriers to to copying uh in in textiles it's very easy to copy so what really our only solution is to innovate innovate faster than our competitors right so they can copy our our our, our previous version but we're innovating and and we're just always making sure one, we're one step ahead of whatever they're doing so who's in charge of innovation so so really there it's myself my father and my wife and 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 our partner um the, the original partner um uh, from the hotels mm -hmm. he 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 gets very involved in these ideas and and at the product mm -hmm. level he he he's come up with a lot of our our best sellers um um a, from an innovation perspective so mm -hmm. so so really we work as a team and constantly trying to make it a little better a little better and 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 really it's 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 listening to our clients right mm -hmm. uh look reading the reviews understanding what went wrong what we did wrong and very quickly innovating and 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 something that for most brands can take them several months half a year to to make changes in a product um for us we were you know since we have such a great team on the ground with the factories we're able to make changes almost immediately and 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 and, and have like a very fast um a turnaround and, and and coming up with a new version of that product very quickly as soon as we have some feedback so 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 it's a very how, iterated, iterated how do you prioritize process. feedback so I, I i think it's something where we we have to make sure that we we we, we keep quality as the number one um, standard right at the end of the day it's all about quality has to come first and then it has to make sure that anything that we do um meets stays within those bounds of like softness and machine washability right so sometimes we'll get feedback for something that will not allow us to keep those value propositions so so we have to make sure that everything stays aligned with with our product values and our product the um you know north north star and so so for us um that that's sort of like the first thing and then from there it's you know you start going down the list and you know making sure that the price is is something that we can work with trying to make sure that we stay uh competitive in terms of cost making sure that and 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 also we've 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 we in the last two years we've really started to shift a lot into a lot of ecological practices during production. So we also make sure that everything that we do um, is we're doing in the most ecologically friendly way. You know, so we started using recycled polyester for a lot of our products, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We started using bamboo, a viscose from bamboo, which is, you know, a much more ecological um, fabric than, 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 than others. So, so, you know, all these things come into the mix when it comes to product development. But at the end of the day, it really boils down to make sure we're having these conversations with the clients. Like I speak to clients directly. Uh, my father, you know, since he's very involved in the product side, like he, he used to take customer service calls for, 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 and he still does, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to understand what issues clients are having. Oh, I washed it and I had this problem or I, you know, different problems that they have during use and see how we can engineer a solution to that. Mm. So it sounds to me like your product, well, not sounds to me, your, your product first business, you know, you, you, you really, the fact that you, you value, the fact that you, you traveled, you moved your family to China to be right there to produce the product before actually going to market just shows your, your product led now, with that in view, you've got your product, you're constantly innovating and you're, you, you know, you, 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 you're setting the right price. What was your go-to-market strategy for the first thousand customers? You know, so we, when we first started, we knew we wanted to 
be a direct to consumer brand, but we wanted to test the waters in different channels. So when we first started, we launched on Shopify, uh, but we had a presence, a, a parallel presence in Amazon. And actually, when we first started, we also went to a, a wholesale trade show uh, to, to, to get the product out there as well. So um, what we really quickly realized is that, um, you know, with Amazon, for example, we realized that we were having to spend quite a lot of money on acquiring customers on, on Amazon, but at the end of the day, they were not really your customers, right? Uh, we started to compare performance of our Shopify store versus Amazon. And what we realized is that the quality of the customers that we were able to get on our store was significantly superior than Amazon, right? Like the average order value was higher. The a repeat rate, you know, the rate of repurchasing was a lot higher. The lifetime value was a lot, lot higher. So very early on, we, we, we realized that we had to drop Amazon and focus all our efforts into, um, into direct to consumer. So, so, so really that allowed us to really uh, hone in on, on, on a single channel. Mm -hmm. uh, we had also tried a wholesale fair. We went there, we went to our first trade show in February of 2020, so mm -hmm. right before COVID, and, and basically, you know, just with everything that happened, again, wholesale was, was out of the question as well. So, so really, we were all 100% focused on direct to consumer, and <clears throat> we started to 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 really um, see that our our you know we. We got to a point, you know. Obviously, at the beginning, it takes a while to to for for your advertising to really start working. But once we got to that LTV to CAC ratio that that made sense to us, that's when we really started to just double down on the strategy and 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 grow. And you know, at the very beginning, we were growing month over month by fifty, hundred percent every every single month, just because we were able to continue doubling down on those strategies that were working. Okay. So with the advertising, what channels did you tap into initially for those first thousand customers? And were you always looking at retention and LTV to, to CAC ratio initially, or was it just to acquire customers and, you know, kind of understand them and have those, you know, have that engagement and interaction with them? Yeah. So, so for us, we, um, at the very beginning, our, our main channels were, I think our main channel was definitely Facebook, uh, Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram. Um, and from the very beginning, we were doing a lot of in influencer marketing. So, so I think at the very beginning, we had those two as our main channels and, uh, and um, we had um, a, a Google also as a big channel, but not as big at the time. Um, when we first started, we had a relatively low average order value because our, a, like I mentioned, the only product that we were selling was, um, the blankets. was the, the blankets, right? Yeah, so yeah. as part of part, something that was very critical was the fact that we ex were able to expand so quickly into all these other categories because it allowed our AOV to double. We really almost doubled our AOV from that original product set into what it is, you know, once we started adding the comfort of the sheets, the pillows, yeah. we really saw our AOV double. So that really gave us that margin to, 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 to make sure that we were profitable, even at the first order to based on our CAC. Um, so, so we had a very profitable unit yeah. economics from the very beginning there. Um, and yeah. and yeah, so at that point, it really became about how quickly we could scale. So it's really good. You, you it's really good point you, you you've made there in regards to, you know, some entrepreneurs are listening, operators are listening to this podcast now, and they're thinking, okay, um, how are we going to improve, you know, LTV to to CAC ratio, and, you know, you'd have all sorts of professionals or consultants saying, Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll automate your email campaigns. But a lot of the time it's an operational challenge. You know, you're, you're like, we have these customers, we've sold them this, this black pen here, 
you know, can we make a green, a red, a blue, <laughs> you know, can we make a pencil? Can we make a ruler? So we're the one stop and they trust us on this, you know, and that's what you guys did with regards to, you know, um, just expanding with, with more products. So they buy more from you long term and you build a relationship with, with that portfolio of products and a trusted brand as a result. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, exactly. and they don't tell you that <laughs> on the outside. They say, no. hey, you know, you need this Clavio, um, you know, email campaign here. You need this triggered campaigns. And, and you know, that engineering of products is really key, especially if you've built a really good reputation up front. Right. And, and, and very important that all of our products had that same, um, fell under the same umbrella of the value proposition. So. Correct somebody that had our blanket and they said, oh my God, this is such a soft blanket. They knew that they could expect that same level of coziness with all our other products, whether it be our bed sheets, our pillows, our comforter, yeah. right? Yeah. And really we became known for the, the brand of soft, of cozy, yeah. right? Yeah. So any product that we had, they already trusted us that it was gonna meet that same standard. So, yeah. so yes. you're absolutely right. Like nothing else works if you don't have the right product right uh yeah. and we see it we see it like whenever we launch our let's say we do a a, a new product a a launch a we see it very quickly that about 80 percent of that initial wave of customers to buy a new product are existing customers mm. you know so 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 really product is what makes that ltv grow a product first business and, and it reminds me of like apple you know you, you 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 trust apple you know with regards to what to expect from from the, they don't divulge from like their their design language and material language right yeah you, exactly. you know from apple whatever they make it's going to be it's going to blow blow the competition out of the water and it's just going to change your life so so yeah it's a it, once a brand has that trust with the customers it really is about maximizing and then that's the beauty of uh, a, a shopify business a d2c business versus wholesale or or amazon right you really are able to lead this communication with clients you're able to control that relationship yeah 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 makes makes a lot of sense makes a lot of sense and so where where are you guys now you know um as a as a business, you're, you're back in Miami. <laughs> you're not, you're not in China. You relocated back. Um, where are you and what was the impact of, of COVID? You know, um, it was a, it was a wild year to say the least, you know, wild two years, particularly for e-commerce. Most, most e-tailers I know, um, saw record sales. It was just, it was a blow up, right? even the markets, you know, <laughs> there's also a lot, there's a rally in the markets all, all through. So do you, do you want to speak to, to that and, and then, you know, how that now compares to, 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 to this period of inflation and, and how you're, you're navigating or how you've navigated the water still to, to date? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, um, yeah, definitely COVID was, was a huge wave that a lot of e-commerce uh, brands benefited, especially being in the home space. We were, you know, people were spending time at home more than ever. They had disposable income to spend. So, so, so really that's what allowed us to really grow at the pace that we did. Um, definitely, I think something, you know, we're not, you know, the people are not spending as much time at home as, as during COVID, of course. But I do think that the relationship that people had with their homes changed. Um, a, the, 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 a people, whether they're still working from home, you know, we, st we get customers that send pictures of how they're taking their Zoom calls on top of their bed, on top of our pillows and comforters, right? So, so, so you know, people that are still working from home are spending um, a lot more time interacting with our products, right? Um, and, and yeah, I just feel that the relationship that people had with their homes um, changed in a very permanent way. So, so we do think that home can will continue to be this like oasis from the craziness of the outside world, and 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 that's where we come in and allowing them to basically fill it up with products that are helping, you know 
products of softness, of coziness, of comfort, of pampering your, yourself, you know? So that, 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 that's sort of like the lasting effect that we, I think we'll, we will benefit from. Uh, but, but yeah, definitely uh, CPMs aren't what they used to be during COVID times, right? Uh, acquisition costs used to, are not what they used to be during COVID co times. So, so that's something where we've definitely had to adjust and grow at a m much more muted pace. Um, uh, fortunately, we've still been able to grow. Last year, we, we, we were still able to grow. Um, and, and yeah, I think a, in terms of, um, the, the way that we've shifted is that, you know, really as a company, we, we sort of changed from being, a, um, a shifted away from having acquisition of the center of our marketing strategy. And now it's really this mix of acquisition with retention that really is at the center of all our marketing strategy, you know, like we've built up the customer base. Now we have to make sure that we can continue catering to this customer, offering new product, making sure that they're coming back and, and, and really having retention at the forefront of everything that we do. So I think that, that, that has been the major, the biggest change, right? Um, again, just because acquisition costs, you know, with inflation and everything, acquisition costs have been going up tremendously over the last couple of years. Um, on an inflation perspective, of course, we were not immune to this. Uh, we, we we saw our our costs go up tremendously. You know, it got to a point where we were paying twenty four thousand dollars for a container a, that before COVID used to cost under you know let's say three thousand, right? So imagine it's like a eight times increase in 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 freight cost delays, etc. Right? So we 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 definitely felt it, but. I think that it's coming down. You know, I think freight t freight costs are back to where they were pre-COVID. Um, China costs are also, in a way, they, they've stabilized and even come down in many ways. Uh, so, so I do think that from 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 a cost perspective, we are seeing that inflationary relief. Uh, but of course, the customer is still feeling it, right? Like the customer is still paying more for food. They're paying more at the pump. They're paying more for rent. They're paying more for everything. And disposable income comes down, right? So at the end of the day, um, that's something that will affect a, the, the whole marketing funnel. Uh, sorry, you're on mute. Funny how the essentials, uh, you know, um, the cost of essentials of, of people's essentials have, have gone up essentially and imported products for, for a large part, uh, stabilized or in some time, in some cases have actually come down. I wanted to speak to you. So we, the, the, the exchange I've had with your press team, the two things that really came to mind from the exchange one was the fact that um they, they they mentioned the fact that you have tips on how to win your business off facebook ads i found that very very interesting and the the second point was more around just the d to c just the impact of of retention um your business is saying do you want to speak to to the points around winning your business or Facebook first? Yeah, so I, I think Facebook has been a wild roller coaster where whatever worked, you know, I think for, for a long time, we had a very consistent strategy in Facebook that was consistently working, right? And, and we had even the same ads were consistently the top winners. Like we didn't even have to change creatives much. Um, I think that we went from that period of stability into a period where almost every month it was a new strategy that was working on Facebook. So where we are right now is that, you know, when we, first of all, on the privacy, right? Like after iOS 14, we definitely see a deterioration in, in, in Facebook ads. Uh, especially anything that had to do like like lookalike audiences or all, all that really really deteriorated and and we were forced into 
trying out all different types of campaigns, you know, so we went into interest based campaigns mm -hmm. and those worked for a while, but then they stopped working. Then we went into more broad, open um, targeting and that worked for a while and then it stopped. So, so we really were um, constantly changing strategies because we would see short term successes, but not too lasting. Uh, the only thing that we've seen now, so, so, so we had that period of deterioration and now we're starting to see a comeback uh, through Advantage Plus on, on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So Advantage Plus, it, it's this black box, AI driven um, structure where in a way we lose a lot of control, right? Like we're not, yeah. we don't know exactly why What's things are working. On? Exactly, but we know that they're working, right? And we're starting to see a consistent improvement in in, in ads. Um, and, and, and and yeah, I wouldn't say that they're back to where we were pre-iOS 14, but we're definitely inching our way back. Uh, and, and really our the, the success of our, our, our Facebook and, and our, our meta strategy really came boiled down to creatives, right? So, so, so really, uh, if it stopped being about choosing the right audiences and it, it went more into creatives, 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 right? Like not only making the right creatives, but making a tr tremendous volume of creatives that we, before we, we, we weren't doing, like we, 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 we went from maybe doing five to 10 creatives a month. Now we do 50 or a hundred creatives a month, right? So we mm -hmm. really increased by an, but by, by, by tenfold the, the, the amount of creatives that our team is generating and and that that forced us into also having to be very creative on 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 how to get them right so we started working more and more with influencers with content creators we started working more with um our existing customers so so really it went from a it, it all boiled down to creatives now i think in terms right. of book success yeah, yeah. Ad, AdWords have a similar sort of black box. Correct, with performance. You know, system, yeah, 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 yeah. So what's your background? I'm just curious because you, you seem to be going into detail um, in on Facebook advertising. Um, do you, do you, are you actively involved in, in, in the marketing for, for, for Sunday yeah, Citizen? So, or? so we do have a media buyer. Um, mm -hmm. That, that does the day to day, but I I like to get very involved in that part. Um, Interesting. So, so I'm I'm very you know again a numbers guy, so so I like to yeah. get to into that quite a bit. Uh, my wife, even, even though she's the, the the CMO, her her focus is more on the creative side, on the website, on mm -hmm. on, the, on the more visual and and brand side of the things, right. and I, I sort of keep my hand on the on the actual spend of the media buying for interestingly are you leveraging ai like chat gpt in, in in anything at the moment in your business uh we are we are we you know we we actually had this morning a whole uh a whole call with the whole team on different ways that they could start using it i think it's something where I mean, I started using it in my day to day, like at least once or twice a day. I, I find mm -hmm. myself using it, and um, and you know, my our customer service team started using it already. Mm -hmm. uh, if they've been using it for like a month already, um, and, and yeah, I think at this point everybody's experimenting with it and finding creative ways that they can start using it. Mm -hmm. Well, before you, let's say you had somebody that was writing an email and they had to wait for the copywriter just to fill in a, like a little short paragraph. Now yeah. they can maybe just be more efficient and self-sufficient through chat GPT. So I think it's interesting the way it's changing the dynamics of, of the team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I find it very fascinating. And I, and I have to say, um, it has helped me write some of the, the best, um, ad copy for Facebook, wh whether it's coming up with titles, obviously, you don't use it 100%, but it just gives you a fantastic framework to, to take on and adjust exactly. um, at, at this point in time. So yeah, a plus one to chat GPT, great timing, especially now with the economy doing what it is doing. The second point I wanted to make, I actually jabbered on the second point, which is like D2C, you know, the second point I wanted to make was really your foray into a store. You know, you're, you're, you're now 
essentially trying to deliver this omni channel or multi channel experience um where did you how did you make that big decision of of having a flagship store um where is it located and and how's that going yeah so it, it, look in my opinion i think that owned brick and mortar is still d to c right mm -hmm. um we are still going directly to the consumer. It's just in a different capacity, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And it really boils down to finding the way that's more convenient for your customer to connect with you, okay? We used to do a survey of people that didn't buy from us, people that came into the website, gave us their email, but they didn't end up buying. And we, we sent a survey and the, 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 the biggest reason behind not buying from us was that they wanted to touch the product first, right? It, we, our, our, our whole value proposition is soft, soft, soft. And all we can do is show you a picture, right? And, and have some copy to describe it. But at the end of the day, you, you want to feel it, right? So, so we, we saw that people were really asking to be able to touch the product. Um, and that's when we realized that having a brick and mortar store allowed us to connect with our customer in mm -hmm. ways that we weren't able to before. So we, we've seen the store to be, I mean, it's still very early. We you know we launched in November, so we're still learning the ropes through this. But, you know, remember that my background with the suit business was also in the brick and mortar store. So mm -hmm. we, for there, it was sort of like the opposite, where we would acquire customers online and bring them to the stores. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're seeing is that we're, we're being able, able to acquire customers through the store that eventually become online buyers for us as well. You know, they'll come into the store, they'll discover the fabric, they'll touch it, they'll connect with the brand. Um, sometimes they'll buy right there and then, but sometimes they'll decide to buy from our website, right? So, okay. you know, the, the logic is that somebody that comes into the store is more likely to convert with an ad that they see from you later on than somebody that hasn't, yeah. right? Um, and, 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 and vice versa, right? Let's say somebody uh, already bought from us online and we have a new collection that just launched. Hey, might as well just go into the store, check it all out and, 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 and make my purchase. So, mm -hmm. so we decided to open in New York City. We're in Soho in, in right in the corner of Crosby and Broom. Um, you know, it's like a little avenue of D2C home brands. We have like parachute like two blocks away we have the citizenry we have us like there's a lot of like home brands a lot of d2c brands in that area so um we we do think it's a great way for our customers existing like new york is already our biggest market so it's a great way for yeah. our existing customer base to come and see us but it's also a great way to get exposure to to and it's so at the end of the day so it's for locals but it's also for for people that are traveling to New York as tourists from all over the world. No? So it's a great way to get that brand out as well. It's got, it's got high footfall traffic. I was going to ask you, because one of the questions I had at the back of my mind just now was like, how, how did you sort of zoom down to exactly where the 50, in, 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 the, in the most simplistic states, that in the most simplistic way, the, the 50 states in the US, you know, how do you whittle it down? And it's a data, it's really going with the data if, if New York oh, is, yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing I wanted to point out is there's a problem we solved with, um, you know, back in the days I used to work with a tiling company here in the UK. And what we did when people wanted to, obviously, it's a big project trying to get tiles into your house. So what we did is we sent them free samples. Um, so they, they would just get free samples and then we'll put them in the flow, an email flow, which then, um, you know, sort of like, how your tiles, you know, speak to us directly. And then we had like a 60% conversion from sample to, to actual sale mm -hmm. off the back of that. So we actually brought it to them for free. And yeah, that was quite interesting. Just wanted to segue on that. Yeah. So yeah. And the other point is just looking at, um, like looking at Crocs, for instance, looking at the financial statements of Crocs, you know, as you alluded to the, their D2C, how they categorize D2C is brick and mortar in croc stores and their website, as well as Amazon, because yeah. it's, yeah, so, so it's a very, very good point you made there. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is, this is really, really interesting. Now, one question I had at the back of my mind was you come from a finance background. How has finance 
has finance given you an advantage in running a D2C business, in running Sunday Citizen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, first of all, running any business requires a lot, a lot of a cash flow management. You know, it's not only about profitability, but cash flow management and being able to to project that is is, is a challenge. You know, especially especially for 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 growing businesses. Uh, you know, we we had. Uh, um, an initial capital contribution when we started the business and we were able to grow to eight figures without any outside capital. Um, so, 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 so that required a lot of like creative ways of making sure that the cash flow was working the right ways. Um, because yeah, even though we tried to stay profitable at the, the first order, you know, the inventory ends up consuming yeah. such a capital. big amount of capital that it's it's always a challenge you know so i think that that's that part is important but i, I think that the 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 biggest thing was this ability to understand the marketing numbers through a financial perspective through a financial lens where you see it the way you would model out the cash flow of any asset, right? Where you see an initial customer acquisition, which would be the equivalent of, let's say, a CapEx in finance. And then you see how that initial um, acquisition gives you an, an expected cash flow over a projected period of time, right? So, so mm -hmm. it's a way of thinking that that's very ingrained in, 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 in the finance industry. And when you bring it into the way you look at at advertising, um, it allows you to really appreciate what you're doing on the advertising front. Not only be, not only from the revenue that it's bringing in today, but the the ability to get that customer and and, and grow the LTV over time. And it's 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 there, there's a very financial way that you can look at that. You no, know? um, we have a real ROI. Um, so yeah, that, that that also led me to have that confidence to know that we were acquiring customers that sometimes would be more and more expensive, but at the same time that we knew we felt confident that we were able to uh, re profit from them through their future cash flows. Interesting, super super interesting. And what does I'm going to go, I'll, I'll touch back on, on finance again, but what three tips would you give to, to any e-commerce operator looking to open their first store? So, sorry, can you repeat the question? So what three tips would you give to any e-commerce operator looking to, to, to get their first brick and mortar store off the ground in 2023? Yeah, so, so so I think that definitely, first of all, is make a data-driven decision, right? Like go to where your customers already are. Mm -hmm. um, that's, the, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is make sure that the, the you know, you, 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 Ideally, these stores become profit centers in as themselves, but you you have to also see them as acquisition channels. So you have to almost see it as the same way that you would uh, any other marketing channel, whether it be Facebook or TikTok or whatever, right? Where you have an expense and you have how many customers are, am I being able to acquire through this channel, and you end up coming with an equivalent CAC, and also you have to look at the LTV of these customers, because what we we expect, I mean, we, we, it's still too early for us to really draw a definite conclusion from it. But what we expect is that the LTV of a customer that was acquired through the store is going to look very different than, a, than the LTV of a customer that was acquired uh, purely online. Even the and that's, that's what you have to start to, to sort of track and, and see how not only how much these customers are costing you, but how much, uh, the, what the quality of those customers is. Um, and the third thing is 
the operation. Really, operations for a store, running a store, can be a huge, huge drain on the business. Um, like I saw it when, when we first opened the first store for Hive and Colony, I ended up having to move to Boston to make sure that we were operating the store correctly during those first months. Um, it, it's a big drain. It's, it's, it's very, very time consuming. The, the leases, the staffing, the build out, it's, it's very, very draining. So for this store, what we ended up, ended up doing is that we ended up partnering with a company called Leap. Um, it's almost, they, they do like retail as a service. So they, they're sort of like your partners in the operation mm -hmm. of, the, of the store. And, and for us, it's been great because they really took away that um, headache and burden of operating the store. So it's called Leap, Retail as L a Serve. Yeah, L-E-A-P. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, so going back to, to, to finance, what at least, at least, uh, I'm saying, giving you a minimum list, shopping list, what is your capital stack like? What, what is enabled Sunday citizen grow so fast. You you, you alluded to, to 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 being in eight figures. You know, growing fast to eight figures. What what financial instruments? What what what's what's been the the bread and butter, the essentials, the real essentials to to making this happen, this this growth happen. I mean, I, I think uh, the number one is really really understand your unit economics. Um, at the end of the day, your gross profit is what allows you to, you know, to, it gives you the muscle power the, the, to, to really invest on the marketing side, right? So, so almost like a $10 improvement on your gross profit, that just means that you have 10 more dollars to acquire uh, on your marketing, right? So, so every dollar saved at the gross profit level is an extra dollar that gives you more room to work with on marketing. So, so really understanding that unit economics is super important, making sure you, it's optimized as much as possible, making sure that your, 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 your shipping and, and, and all those costs are as optimized as possible. Um, then, then we also used, you know, as we were growing, we, we used a lot of tools like a clear co and, Shopify Capital and Wayflyer. Um, and those tools, look, they're, very, they're great. I think they serve a very, very important uh, function for any growing company. But at the same time, you have to be very careful with them because, you know, the way they structure is that they give you the money up front. They take a percentage of your revenue. Um, and, and, and basically, that just means that you have that cash now, but if you spend it all, you you later on it just eats up into your cash flow, and you, you it might strangle you to the point where you need more capital from them, so they take a bigger share of your revenue, and it it, be, it can become a death trap for a lot of companies. So so I think you know this is like a general rule of finance: like make sure you align short term assets with short term liabilities, long term assets with long term liabilities, right? So. I think the, the 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 danger here, like if you're using these tools like Shopify, Shopify Capital, for example, to finance your marketing, where you're seeing a very quick ROI, right? You're, you're spending it, you have a good ROS, you get the money back very quickly, right? Uh, that's okay, that's okay. But I think it gets dangerous when you're trying to use that to finance, let's say, your inventory. Because again, you're using a short-term debt. You know, these debts are very short-term. You have to pay them back within four, four to six months, right? So you're using that to pay for a long-term asset, which is the, the, the inventory that can take you several more months to actually cash in on. So that's when it gets very dangerous, when you have this, that disalignment. It makes a lot of sense. So short-term to short-term and, and long-term to, to, to long-term. Did you, what about um, negotiating with the factories? You know, you, you, you said you control the supply chain out in China. Were there any efficiencies to be made at the back end, um, particularly if you're putting, you know, products on a ship and that's going to take, you know, three three months to, to, to get to the States? How, how were you managing, you know, those time lags and, and finance? Yeah, look, I think it's something that's not easy to get, especially if you're starting a relationship with a factory in China. Most of them will not give you credit. 
Um, I think with us, we've built a good enough relationship to the point where we do have uh, some credit and that, that has definitely helped a lot. We were able to negotiate um, credit on, on, on the payment, on the balance payment, and also make sure we minimized the, 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 the amount of the deposit that we had to put for every order. So negotiating those rates is helpful, but again, having worked with factories for so long, it, it's, it's not easy to get. It, it takes mm -hmm. building up that relationship. Uh, another thing is that, you know, we, we've actually shifted a big chunk of our production into outside of China. So, so okay. we're doing a lot of products in Turkey now. Um, a lot of our bedding we started doing in Mexico. Mm. Um, so, so for example, for us, Mexico has been great because there you have a much shorter lead time, mm -hmm. right? Um, the production, let's say production takes the same amount of time, but literally from the moment that you, you, it, it, it leaves the factory until it gets to your warehouse, it's less than a week, you know? So, mm -hmm. so, so that has also been a very interesting uh, shift that we've and done. Is, is there a free trade, you know, arrangement between U.S., Canada, and, and Mexico? Yeah, yeah, you definitely get some, some, some benefits there as well. Um, um, I mean, now the shipping is not as expensive as it was before, but still, you know, you get a lot of efficiencies with taxes, with shipping, um, and and lead times, you know. Yeah, super interesting that you you've um, you know de, de risk yourself from from a you know, sort of far east um, you know supply chain. Very 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 interesting. Okay, um, was that off the back of of COVID? You know, you remember after COVID, there was or over the course of COVID, there was um, you know, there were real big challenges with with getting things off um, off the back of China or even Asia, and many many operators were, were looking to diversify their, their supply chain. Is, is that when you, you made the decision or it was further back? Yeah, yeah. We, we started the relationship with the Mexican factory uh, about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I mean, sort of like when we were in the middle of these issues with supply chain and everything, and we realized that we had to um, de-risk our our our, our exposure to to China and, mm -hmm. and and start working with Mexico. So so and again for, for us Mexico was very easy because we had I mean like I, like I mentioned we I grew up there we we knew a lot of people it's it's an environment that we know how to work yeah. quite well. I have a final question which has got to do with your brick and mortar operations, right? Um, what are you doing to unify customer information, um, so customer data? Are you using a Shopify POS there? Yeah, yeah, we use a Shopify POS, okay. um, which integrates directly with our store online store, yeah. and we share. So basically, it it all integrates very. All seamless. integrates, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Thanks. we even for returns exchanges, we're trying to make sure that it's as seamless as possible in, in yeah. both directions. So, so I'm I'm based in England, as as you you may have gathered, and I was in the states over Christmas visiting family in Chicago to be precise. And one thing I noticed that's not done here, what's done like insanely in American stores is like, they just ask, what's your email? Like everywhere, whether it's a Target, whether it's a, whether it's a whole, you know, Whole Foods, whether it's Best Buy, they just ask you for your email, like email data, customer data is, is just seamlessly collect, you know, collected in, in, in stores in, in the States. So, so are you, are you doing that? Um, how how does that work? What what what's the in store experience like? Yeah, so so definitely we want to make sure we collect as much data as possible. Um, we basically in our store in our in our website we do give first time customers um, uh, a discount on their first purchase. Mm -hmm. So we extend that offer to the brick and mortar store. And we say, look, you'll get a discount on your first purchase, but you have to give us your email. So they basically automatically sign up into our loyalty program and everything, and and they get that first first time discount. So, so yeah, that that's super important that they got it, got it. that we collect as much of that as got possible. It. And do you do anything for browsers like you know um, people who who are not quite gonna buy? Is, is there any email collection in store that you you engineer? Yeah, so we have QR codes that we say, hey, you can scan it and, and, and get a discount for future purchase. We have little flyers that they can take with them. Okay. That also has a QR code 
in, in case they want to buy later on. So, so we try to make sure they, even if they don't buy, that they at least uh, connect with a brand in one way or another. Interesting. Mike, Mike, it's, yeah, this is, I really enjoy this conversation. Um, I'm going to be very respectful of your time because I know we'll go on and on and on. Um, uh, we always end every episode with uh, with with a lightning round. It's a set of rapid fire questions where I ask you a, a question and then you answer with a sentence. Some people have pushed the sentence, but but hey, you know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> right. So ready when you are. Ready. Right. Are you a morning person? Yes, morning. Okay. So what does your morning routine look like? Um, I try to run in the mornings, then I have to take the kids to school. And then I try to be in the office by around like eight to eight thirty. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Are you into sports? Yeah, now less than I would have liked to, but I do running and rock climbing. Okay. Do you have a, a favorite sports team you follow? Um, not really. Okay. What two things can't you live without? The ocean. Oh yeah, you live. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> and and um, and um, yeah, no, and 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 my running. I think for me, my running yeah, my is running. Okay. yeah, running in the ocean. That's it. Yeah. Okay. What book are you currently reading or listening to? Um, currently reading Brave New World. Hmm. Okay. What's been your best mistake to date? By that, I mean a setback that's given you the biggest feedback. Um, really, for me, the, the experience with my uh, having Colony partner was very bitter very a very difficult experience to go through and it really showed me that i i can't be as trusting as a person as i used to mm. be mm. mike abadi it's been a pleasure having you on the 2x e-commerce podcast and for those who want to find out more about sunday citizens it's sunday citizen.co that's s-u-n-d-a-y c-i-t-i-z-e-n dot co i will link to it in the show notes um, I see you You have a very, very thriving community on Instagram, Facebook, and your LinkedIn. Would would, would guests, would you like to connect with guests on LinkedIn and we could share that um, on, on, on the show notes? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Happy to connect with your listeners and answer any further questions that they may have. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on the 2X e-commerce podcast, Mike. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me.